Good evening and welcome to Boston University's Real Estate Club Speaker Series for conversations about real estate leadership management and people who have achieved something in our society. Today, we're honored to have Owen Thomas, the CEO of Boston Properties with us. He's been with Boston Properties since 2013 and held numerous high-level executive positions prior. Today, Boston Properties is the largest public developer and owner of Class A office space in the United States. I'm pleased to welcome to this virtual room Owen Thomas. Good to have you here, Owen. Thank you, Michael. Pleasure to be with all of you, uh, kind of. Um, <laughs> I mean, meaning we're not really together, but, uh, but it's, it's good to join you in this format. You have a full and impressive career, first with Morgan Stanley for 24 years, where you held various executive roles, including CEO of Morgan Stanley Asia, President of Morgan Stanley Investment Management, and Chairman of Mitsubishi UFJ Morgan Stanley Securities. You then went on to become chairman of Lehman Brothers in 2012 post-bankruptcy. As a starting point, could you tell us a bit about your journey? How has each transition or move informed the next? And what did you learn about yourself and your career? Well, that's a lot to, that's a, that's a lot to answer, Michael. Uh, so I, look, I just wanna say I'm pleased to be with all of you. Uh, I'm delighted of your interest in real estate. I'm happy to try to help you um, you know, delve into that further and talk about careers. Michael was very thoughtful in putting together a number of questions, but also I'd like you all to just ask me things directly as we get into this more, because I've done this with students at other schools and um, I, I often find the, the, you know, the best content is, you know, when you ask questions and the things that are really on your mind. But, you know, to answer your question, uh, to go through it, um, you know, there's lots of steps and lots of pieces to that, but I'm from a rural area of Virginia originally uh, in the Shenandoah Valley, and um, I went, I was an engineering student undergrad because I was good at math and science, and I thought that's what I should study. And I finished that, and I worked as an engineer for a couple of years uh, and did not like that as a career and was fortunate to get into Harvard Business School. And while I was there, I took a real estate class that really uh, piqued my interest. Uh, in the rural area where I grew up, my father, in addition to uh, owning and running a farm, he also had a real estate business where he was a broker of farms and he had other realtors in the office that sold houses and we developed farms from time to time. And so when I was a teenager, I worked for him. I got a license in the state of Virginia at age 18. Um, I was definitely the youngest person <laughs> in the testing center. And so I had this little real estate bug that I didn't realize was there and it got sparked when I was at, at Harvard. And um, so I had a good friend in my section who was a senior at JMB Real, Realty and he kind of explained the whole industry to me. And so I pursued uh, jobs in real estate and landed at Morgan Stanley. And um, when I started there, we were uh, exclusively an advisor. You know, we represented clients, raising capital, selling buildings. And while I was there, we got it. And then there was a big um, crisis in 1990, 1991, uh, where real estate values were um, decimated and the group actually shrunk, but we actually got in the principal business at that time. And um, so I worked my way up and ended up running that principal business. And then I ran all of Morgan Stanley real estate and then, uh, as Michael mentioned, my other roles at Morgan Stanley. And then I decided to leave about 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I turned 50 and I'd been at Morgan Stanley 24 years. I was living in Asia. My kids were, you know, in high school and I thought it was just a good time to come home. And I got recruited to uh, become the first chairman of the post Lehman um, bank, post Lehman bankruptcy board, which was an amazing experience. You know, we had a trillion dollars of claims. We have distributed, I think, 150 billion plus or minus a capital to um, claimants at this point. Uh, almost finished with that. And then about, uh, actually it's eight years ago tomorrow, uh, I started at Boston Properties. Um, I knew, uh, I, I followed an iconic founder named Mort Zuckerman, uh, who was a, the CEO of an S&P 500 company, and he was in his 70s. And 
uh, he and the board decided it was time to have a succession plan. And I was fortunate enough to be selected to be part of that and have been CEO ever since. So, you know, in terms of the transitions, I think, you know, the, the couple of things I would say, you know, go with your passion. I assume all of you, since you're on this call, are interested in real estate. It's a very rewarding career, in, you know, not just financially, but, um, you know, if you love the built environment and you love buildings and you love place and maps, as I do, you know, it's a fun thing to do. Um, you know, I've tortured my wife and children over the years. We go to a city and I'm always driving around looking at the real estate and, um, <laughs> You know, they think I'm nuts, but, you know, you, you just kind of have it in your blood. So, um, so I think it's finding your passion and, you know, going for it. You know, I, I think uh, clearly you have to work hard. You have to be committed. Uh, you have to be honest. Uh, you have to do your best. Uh, and, but I think, you know, when you get opportunities, like with all those different job changes I had, I never said no to anybody. You know, I, I, felt humbly that I could succeed in the new job and I went for it. I never said, oh, I, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to do it. So um, so I think that's part of it. You know, you got to have some ambition. I, I don't know with me whether it's ambition or just curiosity. You know, I'm a student of business. I love business. So when I get the chance to do something different, um, you know, or more senior, I just it just feels like I'm going to learn a lot more and it, and it satiates a lot of my intellectual curiosity. That's as much of a driver for me as the as the ambition. Um, so I think those are the kinds of you know the kinds of things that drove me uh, over the years. Really appreciate it. Let's talk a little bit more about Morgan Stanley. Uh, while you were with that firm, you and your team built up a really big real estate principal activity for them through numerous opportunity funds and strategic acquisitions, such as Lend Lease US's real estate investment arm. Can you talk to us about how you and your team built or grew this platform? Yeah, so the the um, the first fund was created in I don't know ninety one or ninety two, and it wasn't huge. I mean, at the time, it was about five hundred million dollars, and um, you know we ended up raising multi billion dollar funds, uh, and the firm still does. Uh, but um, it was you know we were a new manager, and it was a hard time to raise the capital, and. Um, uh, cause you know, real estate was, you know, the best time to invest in things is when no one wants it. And so, uh, but we were able to actually it was my predecessors in the business were able to get the pension funds of general motors and AT&T to back the fund. And we brought in some other LPs and raised 500 million and the timing was just amazing. I mean, everything was for fire sale. It was the RTC if you've resolution trust corporation crisis. If you're familiar with that things were, it's very different from today. Things were trading at half of a replacement cost and um, clearly some judgment had to be made, but things were, you know, cheap. And the, the, I think the IRR of that first fund was 35 or 40% net of fees. I mean, it was big. And so in the opportunistic fund world where you're, you know, investing, it's a closed end fund. You've got a fixed term to invest the capital and to return the capital. Um, you know, the investors, you know, expect you to turn the assets pretty quickly and they want a high yield because it's an opportunity fund. So we did that. So I think the next fund was twice as big. And um, so then we invested that successfully, not as successfully, you know, the, uh, the probably the returns in that one were 25 or 30% because the environment wasn't quite as attractive. And then, you know, we were the other big thing that we did that we were distinguished ourselves as leaders is um, we were primarily a domestic investor. But Morgan Stanley was a global firm and we had offices all over the world. And we said to ourselves, look, we, we can figure this out. You know, we can buy real estate in the UK and in Italy and in Japan and in China because we're not starting from scratch like most other managers. We've got actually Morgan Stanley people in all those countries. So we started doing international business in our fund. And what we found is that some of the investors liked it and some didn't. And so then we had this idea, let's just break it apart. You know, let's have the Morgan Stanley real estate funds domestic and let's have the ones international. And, you know, we were, we actually outperformed on the international side and it was a very unique product. Not many people were in it. Uh, very few people were as successful as we were in terms of returns. And, um, you know, we were able to really grow that business as a result. So, so the opportunistic business got big and then, um, 
we started to say to ourselves, look, you know, the, the real estate investment business is much bigger than opportunity funds. You know, they're value added funds, there's core activity, they're, they're separate accounts, you could do debt funds. So we started to think to ourselves, well, we've got this, now we've got this global platform. We've got all these experienced executives that most of which we were homegrown. You know, what more can we do with this franchise? And so, you know, I went to my bosses at the firm and got them interested in doing an M&A deal to get into the uh, core business. It's hard to grow that from scratch. You know, these open-ended core funds, you need a long-term track record. It's very hard to do that from whole cloth. Um, so, uh, so we, we did that and we got in the market and, you know, some deals came, came by, probably most notably Reef, which was ended up, ended up being sold to Deutsche Bank. Um, and then Lendley's came along and it was an excellent fit with us. And they were very keen to sell the business. And we got the, uh, uh, the prime property fund, which is now the Morgan Stanley prime property fund. And I think it's actually one of the bigger and more lucrative um, real estate investment products at Morgan Stanley today. And the team, to their credit, has done a lot of great investments and they have a strong track record. And I think they, you know, outperform a lot of the Odyssey funds in that space. So, um, so again, it was, a, you know, I think you, first of all, in investment management, you have to be successful to grow in terms of return. So we were able to do that. And then we started to think laterally about other products that we could successfully invest. Thank you. Really appreciate that, Owen. Uh, remaining with Morgan Stanley for maybe one more question. Uh, you did have the opportunity to live in Hong Kong for several years while CEO of Morgan Stanley Asia. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about your experiences working in that part of the world? Yeah, so um, I, uh, there was a, um, you know, I had run a, a business, you know, the real estate business at Morgan Stanley, and then I was asked uh, to run an, a product division of the firm, the asset management division. And then I guess it was in 2007, 2008, um, the head of the Asia region, so now it's a regional head of the firm, left. And uh, the firm asked me to move over and become a regional head. So this was a different kind of job because it wasn't running a global product. It was actually running a region. And so a lot of my responsibility was um, hiring country heads in all the uh, Asian regions. So my region spanned from China to Australia to Japan to India and all the, you know, Southeast Asia, Korea, all these nations. So it was recruiting and, and managing and leading a set of country heads and then also ensuring that all the divisions were coordinating with one another. You know, we had investment banking, equities, fixed income, uh, you know, real estate was up and then asset management was part of the real estate uh, group and then private wealth management or, um, or retail uh, management. So getting all these divisions to coordinate. Uh, I, I love the role. You know, I spent a lot of time with clients. You know, it was helpful to have the CEO of the region get an active with the clients. So I enjoyed that. A lot of, um, a lot of leaders, leaders in Asia were real estate people. You know, they, were, uh, they had built wealth in the real estate business. So that was super helpful because I had background in that and could speak more um, fluently about it. And, uh, and then personally, I had my uh, wife and three kids over there with me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was just a great family experience as well in terms of travel and, and providing all of us with a, a unique cultural experience. I would say, you know, for all of you on the call that are Americans, uh, sometime in your career, do yourself a favor and work outside the U.S. Uh, because we, you know, we, we have a great country. Everything you need is here. We know beaches, mountains. Uh, different, you know, it's, it's a great country, but it is, you just learn a lot by living outside the U.S. and experiencing different people and cultures and systems. And, you know, I just think it's a, a life enhancing experience and would highly recommend it to any of you. After Morgan Stanley, you became the chairman of the board at Lehman Brothers in 2012. In this role, you oversaw the successful dispositions of a range of assets including the sale of Archstone to Equity Residential and Avalon Bay Communities for approximately $15 billion. Can you talk to, can you talk to us about this disposition in particular? Yeah, sure. The, the, um, you know, the Lehman situation was very unique. Uh, it was the largest bankruptcy in history. And I think all of us hope that it will remain the largest bankruptcy in, in world history. 
literally there were a trillion dollars of claims that were negotiated down to about 350 billion. And uh, we did distribute, as I mentioned earlier, about a, I think 125 to 150 billion so far. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several billion left, you know, that we're still working on. Um, the assets were everything, you know, derivatives, private equity positions, debt securities, and there was a lot of real estate. Uh, and it was the biggest asset class because Lehman had been a big investor and lender into the real estate world. And one of the assets that they owned because they had a failed bridge loan was Archstone. You know, I think it was uh, Tishman Spire bought the company and they took a loan out from Lehman and I uh, and uh, two other banks uh, as a bridge. Uh, and of course, the global financial crisis occurred and then those bridges became the equity. So what we did... One of the first things we did when, so when, when Lehman came out of bankruptcy, you know, it had accumulated a lot of this cash from disposing of things. And when it came out of bankruptcy, cash started, we, we kept liquidating things and working out assets and cash was distributed in basically quarterly, I think maybe it was twice a year distributions. So, um, so one of the first things we did when we came out of bankruptcy is um, the, the asset from memory was owned in joint venture between Lehman and a couple other banks. And those banks, uh, I believe, had offered a some kind of option to um, SAM and EQR. And I, what we did it, when we got, we, what we decided is we wanted to control our own destiny. So we came in and, um, uh, uh, basically uh, made a financial settlement with EQR. And then we bought for several billion dollars, the 50% of Archstone that we didn't own, which is a pretty aggressive thing to do if you're a, a, an a liquidating, you know, bankrupt uh, entity. But we thought it was the best way to maximize value. And it turned out to be true because what we did is we turned around, um, you know, Archstone was a great company, it had very high quality assets, had a great management team. And it was IPO ready because it had been public before and it had a great track record. And Scott Sellers, who's the CEO, had a very strong following in the public market. So we filed to go public and uh, we were going down that through that process, you know, of uh, filing with the SEC and, you know, getting ready to go public. And what often happens uh, when companies file to go public is some strategic buyer, you know, comes forward. And so in this case, uh, EQR and AVB, who are the two biggest apartment companies said, look, we don't wanna have another apartment company that's public and we like Archstone's assets. So they did a, I mean, we weren't involved in it because we were on the other side, but they did some kind of baseball draft where they divided up the Archstone portfolio and then they made a joint proposal to us of both cash and stock. Uh, to buy the whole company. And it was pretty big. It was like $13 billion, as I, as I remember. And then from our standpoint, you know, we said, okay, if we go public, we're going to have um, some cash, but we're going to own a lot of Archstone stock. And if we do this deal, you know, may, even if the price was the same, you know, we're going to have more cash. And we did own 10% plus or minus of EQR and AVB, but we you know, we had more cash and we had an interest, a smaller interest in two bigger companies that was more liquid. You know, our goal was not to build an apartment company. Our goal was to create the biggest cash pile we possibly could as quickly as possible. So that was a better execution for what we wanted to do. So we pulled the IPO and did the M&A deal with those two companies. So it was definitely one of the more interesting um, deals that I've ever been involved in. And the other thing that we were very proud of is, you know, we made a nice gain uh, in six months between what we paid for the half that we didn't own and what we sold it to Archstone and EQR for. So that was another, um, you know, accomplishment that we made as a board. I think now could be a good time to maybe shift focus a little bit to where you are today in terms of Boston properties. Uh, maybe to start here, could you talk to us a little bit about the evolution of Boston Properties from when you first joined as CEO in 2013 to present day today, 2021? Yeah, so um, so I joined in, you know, just to back up for a second on Boston Properties, because, you know, the company obviously is Boston Properties, you're Boston University, the company was founded in your city. 
So two, there were two talented entrepreneurs, uh, Mort Zuckerman and Ed Lindy, who were with a company called Cabot Cabot and Forbes, which was a well-known Boston developer and it ended up being a national company owned by, um, uh, you know, uh, owned by uh, one of the retail families, I believe from Chicago. And so anyway, um, they both left there and partnered and formed uh, Boston Properties in 1970. So, um, so we just had our 50th anniversary of the company uh, last year. And at first, you know, they were, um, they didn't own much real estate, they were advisors, and then they started investing their own money and getting involved in development projects, a lot in the suburbs, Kendall Square, uh, they built the Wharf, uh, Marriott Wharf Hotel in Boston, a lot of things that you all are familiar with. Um, and then in 1997, they went public, and they both were big owners of the, of the company when it went public, but they used it traded at NAV or a premium to NAV and they used that currency to grow the company and they bought some extraordinary assets like the Prudential Center in the back bay of Boston and Embarcadero Center in, in uh, San Francisco. And, you know, they diluted their own interest in the company to buy these assets, but these assets appreciated amazingly. So they did, you know, very, very well. Um, so anyway, the history of the company is um, it's a, you know, the, one of the preeminent companies in the gateway markets of our nation. So Boston, New York, DC, San Francisco, and LA. Today, we're also trying to be in Seattle. Um, you know, we're the largest market cap uh, REIT that, that cover a real estate company that uh, focuses on, on, on office assets in the US. And, you know, speaking humbly, I think it has a good reputation. You know, it's known as a blue chip company. We have the highest debt ratings of any office REIT. And, um, you know, it has, I think, a strong reputation with customers, which is critically important, you know, tenants. So I give you that background because when I joined, you know, everybody was like, well, you know, here's this Wall Street guy coming to Boston properties. He's going to shake the tree and make it all different. And that's not what I wanted to do um, because it was a strong, one of the reasons I joined the company, it was a great franchise, had a great team. And that's not what was needed. Uh, what was needed is um, to take a step back and reflect on the environment that the company was operating in and to make what I'd call shifts in strategy as opposed to sea changes and to continue to build on the company's success. So that's what we did. I mean, um, everyone stayed of the senior management except for the New York regional head who wanted to retire before I joined. So our management team is intact. And I think that's been a secret um, to our success. Um, I do think there were some shifts, however, you know, we definitely foresaw the rise of the technology user as being wildly important to the office business pre COVID and I think post COVID. So the company had a lot of assets that were in traditional locations that were geared more towards law firms and banks. And we've done a lot of new acquisitions and development in areas that are geared much more to technology firms and life science firms. So that's been a shift in the company's strategy. Uh, we also entered Los Angeles for this reason, you know, because there's a big entertainment technology practice there. It's an enormous office market. You know, I felt it was important that we be there and we've bought a couple of major assets and become the largest landlord in Santa Monica. Uh, we've built some amazing buildings. I don't know if you know the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, but we built that, completed that like two or three years ago. You know, it is south of market. You know, the, the uh, again, going back to my theme, all of Boston Properties buildings, you know, uh, uh, you know, had been in the financial district like Embarcadero Center. And now everything that we're doing is south of market and now in the central Soma areas of San Francisco. Just in Boston, you know, good example of this, all the things we've been doing at Kendall Square. You know, we've built, um, we built Akamai's headquarters. You might be familiar with that. We're building Google's regional headquarters right now. If you, any of you have been to the TD Garden, there's a brand new mixed use project that's been built right in front of that. That's our project. So Verizon is going into the office building and we have Live Nation, you know, as a, as a uh, retail tenant. Um, we've got uh, Citizen M Hotel and then there's an apartment complex. That's an exciting 
I'd be surprised if, well, maybe COVID hit before you had a chance to go there, but I think that's an exciting place to go in Boston. And I think representative of the kind of new, new Boston properties in terms of the types of things that we're doing. Thank you for that. I think um, an interesting type of question I'd like to uh, ask is not really as real estate related now, rather uh, organizational behavior. So in your opinion, as the CEO of Boston Properties, how important is organizational behavior for the success of a company? And uh, what would the company culture of Boston Properties be like? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. And it's, I think it's wildly important in all business, including real estate. I think people can have a misperception that, okay, you know, your NAV is the collection. It's an addition of the value of all your buildings and there's nothing in there for the management team or the future growth of the company. And I think that's a mistake because, you know, the, the key to success in real estate is not to just sit back and, you know, collect rent, um, but to be proactive, you know, to be investing in new properties, to be calling out properties that are not going to be as competitive going forward to figure out what properties need to be renovated, you know, to be working constantly with tenants on their uh, issues and demands and needs in terms of renewing them or downsizing or upsizing, you know, them. So it's a very dynamic uh, process. I mean, I think the notion of collecting rent and paying a dividend doesn't seem very dynamic, but if you just do that, you'll never be successful. And you need great people to do that. And, uh, and I do think one of the secrets to Boston Properties is our culture. If you look at the weighted average, you know, tenure of our um, staff, it's very high. Our turnover rates are very low, you know, relative to industry norms. And, you know, I think the culture, I would define it as, um, I would say it's, uh, you know, it, it started as a family business. You know, it was formed by two entrepreneurs. And I think some of that spirit is still there. You know, we are we try to run lean in the good times so that when the bad times come, we don't have to lay anybody off, you know? So, uh, so we're very, and you know, in real estate, that's not easy to do because if you're building buildings, that should get shut down. So what do you do with your development and construction teams in times like that? And we try to, we do uh, not lay off people unless it's for performance reasons. You know, uh, we don't have like reductions in force because of the nature of the business. So I think that's important. But that being said, it's also demanding in the sense that, you know, you, you, uh, no one can BS, you know, if you try to BS your way through something and you don't have the expertise that does not fly, you know, the, uh, we, we operate, you know, with the highest quality buildings with the highest quality tenant base who demand the highest quality service. And that's the spirit under which, you know, that we operate. And then I think the last thing, you know, that's important in real estate is ethics. You know, it's a private business, even though we're a public company, most deals get done on a private basis. They're done with handshakes and legal documents. And we have a culture of if we, if a senior leader at Boston Properties tells a counterparty, we're gonna do something, either buy an asset, sell an asset, do a lease at a certain number, we do it. And then we paper it and we don't change it. You know, there's no retrading, there's no changes. You know, people know that when, you know, they, they have an, an arrangement with us that it's, uh, they can count on us to deliver. And I, I think that's the third most important part of the, of the culture. How has the importance of ESG evolved in the industry during the course of your career? And can you talk to us about some of Boston Properties current ESG initiatives? Yeah, so... Um, so this ESG is important, but you got to break it down into the three components because they're all different and they're all executed by different people in the company. We don't have an ESG department. Um, and I, I actually think both are, all three are important, but I don't like the way they're all grouped together. I don't think it's appropriate, but that's just the way the world is right now. So to go through it all, governance if you're a public company, you're focused on governance and, uh, and you're rated on it and you better have good governance. So, you know, Delaware domicile, um, board directors get elected every year, um, no poison pill, proxy access, um, you know, all these things that are important to corporate governance, you know, that, that's, that hadn't changed. That's, by the way, administrated by the, by the board and by 
the charter of the company and the lawyers. You know, they're the ones that focus on that. And there are, hasn't actually happened that much lately, but, um, you know, there are, there is evolution, you know, on good corporate governance. And we try to stay in front of that and be a leader, but that's been around since the formation of public companies. Um, the second I would talk about is uh, the S. I think this is the most dynamic and um, least structured at this point. And I think S has risen in importance on the heels of the George Floyd murder that occurred in 2020. And I think a lot of what S is, is about is, um, first of all, what policies do you have in terms of benefits, um, you know, for you know, people that are sick, um, uh, uh, families having children, uh, you know, all the uh, paying a minimum or living wage, you know, all these kinds of things are important. And then uh, diversity, you know, what's your diversity, both by gender and by ethnicity? What is that diversity by location and by seniority? And, you know, we're, we're trying to be a leader in terms of both setting goals for those things and also disclosing, you know, all of those factors. And I think that's getting a, becoming a lot more important um, particularly after 2020. And then the last, which is probably the most visible is the E, which is um, environmental or sustainability. Oh, by the way, I should say S, you know, obviously as CEO, I'm very involved in that, but that's administrated by our HR department. You know, they're the ones that are responsible for staying in front of um, best practices on the S, in the S category and making sure that we remain um, executing in that manner. And then last is sustainability. And we formed our own sustainability department about five or six years ago. And we have a engineer uh, who's in charge of that. And um, so this is about, um, we have set public goals for uh, energy intensity, for water use and for um, waste recycling. And related to energy intensity is our, obviously our carbon emissions. And we are pretty close to announcing that we're gonna to try to get, that we are gonna to get to net zero as a company by 2030. I think that's something that we're trying to figure out how to put ourselves in a position to do. And that comes in all kinds of forms, right? We're, we're in new buildings that we build. We want them to be lead gold or platinum, you know, be the most efficient possible. Older buildings that we have, we're always updating all the HVAC and other mechanical equipment in those buildings to make them more efficient. You know, a new thing with COVID is um, health security. So we're getting all of our buildings fit well certified as well, which has a lot to do with, you know, air recirculation volumes and um, fil air filtration. So that's been an important thing. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we've put in a lot of our suburban assets, we've put in solar panels over the parking. So uh, parkers get covered parking for snow and sun, and then that generates power. We have a, a battery in one of our big LA assets where we buy energy at night when it's inexpensive. And then we discharge that battery during the day when power is more expensive. And that helps, you know, a lot of energy um, production is about trying to meet peak loads. And if more companies like us use batteries and buy power at night, you know, this peak load goes down. And so there's less of a need to build another power plant. So anyway, these are all examples of things that you can do to improve your sustainability characteristics. And I think it's increasingly important to the tenants that we serve, the shareholders and, and debt investors that we serve, the communities that we operate in, you know, Boston, Massachusetts just announced some very significant um, uh, targets on emissions and a whole new, you know, green implementation plan that they're rolling out. So our communities are super focused on this. And then our employees, myself included, you know, I, I uh, work is not all just about a paycheck. You know, it's about feeling like you're doing something for the good of others. And, uh, and I think it makes us a more purposeful organization by focusing on these measures and, and uh, competing well in them. We're now just over a year into the pandemic. How has this impacted the office sector, your current portfolio, and how has Boston Properties pivoted in the last year as a result? Yeah, so it's, um, it definitely has had an impact, you know, primarily the use of office. I mean, our, um, you know, top line, our income stream is down about 15%, but that's not from office. 
That's primarily from our variable income streams, which are parking, uh, retail, and hotel. Uh, office, we've been collecting 99% of our rents. We leased uh, three and a half million plus or minus square feet last year with a weighted average lease term of eight years. So office, you know, it's definitely weaker, but it's performed much better than our other segments, you know, throughout the pandemic. So now the issue with it is that not many people are actually physically in the office. The, what we call the census of the buildings is still at around 10% because most employers have not yet specified their return to work plans. But I think this is about to change. Uh, you know, the virus is on the run. Uh, the vaccines are up. Um, and I think we're going to beat this thing. And I think people are going to be, uh, and the economy is going to be opening up. It's already starting to. I already, I went on my first business trip this week. The flights were full. The airports were full. The restaurants were full. The offices were not full. Even in the last couple of days, we've seen um, Amazon announced that they are going to be an in-person work company because they thought it was most important for them to, for their collaboration and invention and onboarding employees. And they did not specify a date, but they basically gave all their employees a heads up that this is coming and they're not going to have a big work from home, uh, if, if any work from home policy at all, in all of Amazon. And they just took a half a million plus square foot new building in Bellevue, Washington. So they're still growing. And then Google today uh, announced, or maybe it was yesterday, that they're all going to be back in the office in September and they're only going to provide a benefit of 14 days a year as a work from home opportunity for their employees. So you've had now some pretty big employers saying, you know, that, that they're going to have an expectation that their um, teams should be back in the office. And that's, you know, that's kind of what I hear from our customers. They leaders don't think work from home is, is uh, a way for their business to be most competitive going forward and they want to get their employees back. And I think the employees want to come back too. I think they've enjoyed working from home and they still want to be able to do that from time to time. Uh, and I think work from home will be a bigger part of the um, work plan for companies going forward. But I don't think it's going to materially dent class A buildings where there are companies that do collaboration um, you know, in, in the spaces. Now, one area where I do think work from home could have a bigger impact is for administrative workers. So you know, if you don't need to collaborate with anybody, then maybe you don't need to be in the office. So you know, maybe some accounting functions, call centers, more administrative roles. I could see buildings that house those kinds of workers or cities that have those kinds of workers. I could see that having a bigger, um, a bigger you know, that work from home having a bigger impact on that. What are some of the most valuable lessons that you and your colleagues have learned from the pandemic thus far? And how do you guys plan to be opportunistic in the next three to five years? Yeah. Well, I think we all learned that we can work from home. You know, I think that was the big surprise. I was worried day one, you know, can we even report? You know, can we uh, get our quarterly report out? And how are we going to do that if we're not together? And so I think we were all a little bit surprised that we were able to, you know, get things done, you know, on a totally remote basis. Um, I think the, you know, the importance of communication, you know, if you're not in person, you know, I was doing town halls with our team like once a week, uh, and then it went to maybe once a month. Now we're doing them twice a quarter. Uh, and I honestly, I think Zoom's been great for that because it's a very efficient and proper way to communicate with our team, you know, about what's going on in the company and what to expect. And, you know, when you go through a crisis, you know, if you have in your company four or 5% turnover a year, um, and we hadn't had the, and the global financial crisis happen 10 years before COVID, you've got a very significant percentage of your workforce that's never been through an economic downturn. So we spent a lot of time just explaining it, you know, that this was, these things happen in business and you just need to, you know, keep your positive attitude, work hard and, you know, things will recover, which, you know, they're already starting to do. So I think just educating, particularly our younger workforce on, what to expect, um, what's going to happen, what do we think is going to happen, and giving them assurances, you know, about the future was a you know important part of what we did. In terms of how we're pivoting, uh, I one of the main things that's happened is life science has really taken off. I mean, that was a hot area before COVID, and it's a hotter area now. These are you know lab building, primary lab and office buildings for 
biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies. We've announced just in the last month, three projects about five or $600 million of investment that we're building in both the Waltham area of Boston as well as South San Francisco. So that's clearly a you know, big pivot for us uh, at this juncture. Uh, we're also trying to make acquisitions, but unlike other downturns, there's really not much distress. I mean, the built buildings that, are, um, that have a long weighted average lease term, their cap rates are the same as before COVID. And buildings that have more rollover, there's a bid ask uh, between the buyer and the seller, and they're not really trading. So, and we've raised a lot of capital to go do this, um, but we have not been able to find that many opportunities at this juncture. Thank you, Owen. Uh, I think now would be a good time to open up the floor for some questions with the audience members. Uh, Prane, why don't you go ahead? Hi, Mr. Thomas. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to meet with us. Pleasure. Uh, time from you has been great. Um, so I had one question. You mentioned that you all had a few property holdings in California, but with the shifting dynamic in the office workspace with a lot of companies moving towards Texas and leaving California, I wanted to know how this is going to impact your future strategy of expansion and what are your thoughts about the future of California as well? Yeah. You know, I, it's a good question and I get asked it all the time by shareholders. Um, but I, again, I'm not, I'm not a fake news guy, but I think you got to be careful about making all your decisions based on what the headlines say. So there's been a lot of headlines about Oracle, Tesla, you know, companies moving to Texas. So the U.S. Postal Service put out data a few weeks ago on everyone in San Francisco that had a change of address and where did they go. And the top 15 locations of people that moved in the last year were Marin County, which is just north of San Francisco, or the East Bay. Austin, Texas was somewhere between 15 and 20 and a small single digit percentage of the moves. So I'm not saying that people aren't moving to Texas, they are, but it's a small piece of what's going on. And um, so I, I do think uh, San Francisco is gonna recover. I, you know, the government has kept the city closed a lot longer than any of our other cities. And I think that's been particularly damaging to the local office market, but that's starting to change. And uh, again, I, I go back to my reference today of Google's announcements and uh, you know, Salesforce announced they're opening their office. Uber, who put all this sublease space on the market, they announced the opening of their office. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm acknowledging that by the way, we operate in the most expensive cities in the country, and there's always a flow of workers from New York, Boston, DC to less expensive locations for whatever reason. But there's also a big flow of younger people like you all moving to those cities because you're excited to live there and be with each other. And as long as you all keep going to those cities, that's where the employers want to be because they want to employ you. And I don't see that changing. I have kids that are in college and uh, that's the places they want to be. So I, I don't see it changing. Yeah, Thank you. So uh, Cole's hands are broken, uh, the virtual hands are broken, his physical hand still works. So uh, he, he messaged me in the beginning. So Cole, feel free to jump in. Hi, Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak. I've really learned a lot. I'm actually from the Bay Area. So I saw how Salesforce really trans like transformed SOMA and I've been to the uh, transit center a few times really yeah. nice area. Um, but I was wondering, Tana, what cities do you find most promising in the future for office space? And do you see any like big developments, kind of like what happened to SOMA in any future markets? Oh, yeah. Look, the, the um, urbanization is a long-term megatrend that all of you should consider in your careers and you can invest in it. It's reliable. You know, humanity's gone through bubonic plague, multiple you know, uh, pandemics, 9-11, you name it. And there are lots of reasons not to be in cities, but at the end of the day, people want to be with each other. They want to learn from each other. They want to have fun with each other. They love the cultural institutions and the educational institutions of these cities. And they're just constantly evolving. You do, it basically, if you have these great sites in the middle of cities, they're just going to get bigger and things are going to change on them. Like look at Kendall Center. 
I've only been at Boston Properties for eight years. We just got our second million square feet of new entitlement at Kendall Center. So we're just tearing down uh, lower rise buildings and building bigger buildings, you know, because customers are taking them. So, um, so I think this, this trend will continue. Um, the centers of San Francisco, New York, Boston, the, the location of these amazing cultural institutions and schools, they're not going anywhere. And you know, people are going to want to continue to congregate in those locations. So I think it will it will continue. We have just in San Francisco. You know, we you talked about the Salesforce Tower. There's uh, we have a um, three quarters of a million square foot site at Fourth and Harrison, and there are four other sites that have Prop M allocation in the Central Soma area of San Francisco, and they'll all get built over time. It's just a matter of you know who's going to take the risk and go first without a customer. We have another, you know, over a million square foot site. It's the closest site to the Diridon station in San Jose that's not owned by Google. And someday we'll start that. We have the next building to get built in the Hudson Yards is um, called Three Hudson Boulevard. It's Three Hudson Boulevard. It's a million eight square feet. You know, we're not going to start it without an anchor tenant, but I'm confident, you know, we'll build that property one day. Um, you know, you've in Boston, we're building, as I mentioned, Google's headquarters, we're just finishing up now the Verizon building uh, that you're aware of, um, you know, and looking at other other opportunities. So, you know, this is what we do. This is what a lot of other people do. The one thing I would say in terms of city selection, that's important is we build buy, and generally hold. So we have to have we have to be in markets where rents go up over time. So we need two things we need employment growth, and we need barriers to entry. So we like to be in these complicated, expensive cities where entitlements are hard to get because that gives some barriers to entry. If you go to other markets like in the Southeast and Southwest, they probably have higher growth in terms of employment, but they have much fewer barriers to entry. And if you look at the rent characteristics over time, you know, the builders are active and they, they it prevents, um, you know, as high rental growth, in my opinion. So it's a fine place to go and be a what's called a merchant developer, which is, you know, you build a building and then when you're finished, you sell it. Uh, but we don't do that. We generally hold um, in the cities that we're in. So so we like our cities for that reason. But there are other good places to invest. You just might not be as long, long a term a holder. Thank you so much. Angie. Hi, um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, I wanted to ask if there's any books that have had a big impact on your career that, that you recommend us reading to learn more about the real estate industry or maybe in business in general? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, the book that I would recommend is, uh, it's called The Real Estate Game and it's written by Bill Pourvu, P-O-O-R-V-U. And he lives in Boston, he, you can meet him. <laughs> he, uh, he was my real estate professor at Harvard Business School. And uh, I think he wouldn't like me saying this, but he probably made a personal fortune, you know, investing in real estate himself. And I like the book because it's not like an academic thing where they're, you know, going through a lot of numbers and, uh, you know, explaining terminology and all that. It's just, it's, the, it's called the real estate game because he kind of explains how the business works which is a big part of understanding, you know, real estate. I'm sure, I don't know the, your class structure at BU, but I assume you have classes where you learn terminology and how to underwrite a building and things like that. Bill's book is more about, okay, that's great, but here's how the world really works. And uh, so I would recommend that. And then look, one thing that's important is even if you're in the real estate business, the whole world affects you you know, we, because the economy is so important to the success of real estate. And that's one of the things that's fun about it. So you, you can't just get in your narrow lane and only focus on real estate news. You need to be aware of what's going on in the world and, you know, where interest rates are headed and what the Fed is doing and what GDP growth is and what's globalization happening and what industries are doing well. So I think having a healthy reading list uh, I, I, you know, read every day or at least skim through the FT, uh, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times. I try to look at Barron's and The Economist. I mean, I, I can't tell you I read all those hit cover to cover. I don't have the time, but I subscribe to all of them and I try to skim through them and understand what's happening. And then, you know, for me, I don't, 
honestly, I don't really like those, you know, business books that are, you know, how to self-improvement. I'm not in, into that, honestly. What I like to read about is real stories of things that happened and try to learn from it. So, you know, I read the book about, um, you know, the bad blood, you know, about the whole uh, Theranos uh, debacle and how did that happen? How could that possibly happen? learn from that. This, um, there's a, a story about a big um, the thing, a story called the billion dollar whale, uh, which was all about this uh, young man who defrauded the Malaysian uh, pension fund and, you know, bought all this real estate and all these things all over the world. It's kind of an interesting story about how something uh, can happen. There was, um, I can't remember the name of it. It was Sumner Redstone's biography, you know, how he started you know, with movie theaters and built those up um, and all the steps that he took in his career, some good, some not so good, you know, in terms of being successful. I like to read those real stories about things that happened or biographies of, of successful business people, um, uh, you know, in terms of learning. For smaller companies that, um, that, that can have a more flexible work, uh, work from home uh, schedule for their employees. Do you think um, similar business models, like say WeWork, uh, would be more popular in the coming years? Like where um, it's only like if, if needed. Like what, what do you think about um, the WeWork business model after the after this pandemic? Yeah, yeah. No, those good questions. But I, I would break that into two questions. You know, what's if small companies different from big companies on in person work, and then what's happening with co working? Look, I think small. Companies, it's case by case. I, you know, I know some small startups. I talked to a gentleman I know that started one in April. He's never met any of his employees other than by Zoom, and he's dying to get an office and at least start interacting with his people. I'm sure they'll always have a strong virtual work, um, you know, culture because of the way they started, but he's going to get an office. You know, he was talking to me about it. So then I have, you know, peers of mine that run their own little investment management boutiques that had an office in New York. And they're kind of saying, you know what, I'm moving to Florida, no taxes. I can work virtually. They not, they, honestly, I don't think they're trying to build a franchise. So they're not as focused on their um, young talent in terms of uh, nurturing and mentoring and uh, apprenticeship. And so, yeah, so that business like that, it could disappear and, you know, from a, from a major city. So I think it's really case by case. And then co-working is going to survive uh, the pandemic. There couldn't have been a worse environment for co-working than a pandemic because one, office was flexible. So, you know, in, if you, you don't have to put your space in the sublease market, you can just terminate the lease. And then second, the business model is all about density. They sell it by the seat, not the square foot. So they try to squeeze as many people into as few who wants to put up with that in a COVID environment? So, but there are, you know, uh, WeWork has 50% market share, strong backing. Now they just went public. You know, they're going to be some survivors. And I've talked to a lot of major corporations and a lot of them will tell you, look, we're, we're going to have our own office. You know, we, we have relationships with our employees based on our office. You know, we like to express our brand. We like our employees. They, we feel like it's a point of pride. They come into our building, they have a desk in our space. It's part of their connection with us. But it's harder to procure, your business needs change more rapidly than the ability to procure space. So I do think a lot of larger companies will, you know, use WeWorks to manage um, their space needs on the margin. If they're moving to a new building, they've got a new business unit that can't quite get into a new space. These things go on all the time, and I think that'll be uh, the opportunity for WeWork going forward. And also small business. You know, one thing, we started our own co-working business at Boston Properties, and we got better at just being easier to deal with. You know, if you're a small tenant pre-co-working, you would come to us and, you know, you'd have a broker, and then you'd have to tour the space, then you'd have to pick a space. Then you'd have to pick an architect to build it. Then you'd have to hire a lawyer to negotiate a big long lease with us. And then you'd have to sign like a five-year commitment. So now with co-working, you don't do any of these things. You know, you, you don't need a broker. Um, the, the, we don't have a lease. It's like a three-page, you know, agreement. 
we, as we tell people, you don't need a lawyer because we're not going to negotiate with you. You know, if, if you don't like it, you'll leave. And if we don't like you, we're going to ask you to leave. So there's no point in spending time, you know, on a lease. Certainly don't need an architect because we already built out the space. And frankly, we already got furniture in it. So if you're a small company and you don't care as much about what your space is, you just want some because you don't even know what your business is going to be in six months. It's a much better product. So I, it's definitely here to stay. Thanks a lot for, for sticking around a little past seven, but uh, sure. thanks for the presentation in general. Uh, I guess my question was uh, looking at BXP compared to the other REIT stocks, uh, they've been able to recover pretty well uh, in the past year uh, compared to some others that you know haven't really recovered much since March, uh, March of last year. I was curious, uh, I was curious, what do you think the factors were for that ability to recover and that, that resiliency over the past year? Yeah, I think you have to look at, you know, we are underperforming the New York names this year uh, on a stock price basis, but we way outperformed them last year okay. because I think that when COVID hit, there was a lot of hand wringing about New York and the New York companies, there's like four of them, you know, Vornado, SL Green, Empire State, Paramount. Uh, you know, they have a lot of New York, if not all New York, and they got really hammered last year, much worse than us. And so I think that, you know, they're getting more of their recovery play as a result. So I think you have to look at it, you know, instead of looking at it on a calendar year basis, look at it more like, okay, from when COVID started, you know, where, where are the stocks now? You know, that, that would be a better way to look at that question. But, you know, to be honest with you, the, our stock was 148 at the peak before, right before COVID, it went down to 78. And now it's like 104. Uh, the income stream is only down 15%. So, uh, the, so the stock price is down more than the income's down. Why? Because I think there's a lot of concern about this work from home problem. And, uh, you know, I've hopefully given you ar the arguments I made to two New York Times reporters this morning uh, about, about it. And um, I think the news on work from home will continue to improve as it relates to real estate, you know, in the coming months. But right now, it's, I think, an overhang for all the office companies. Uh, not to cut in, but I think BURA is going to take the credit over the New York Times if this type of statement boosts the stock price in the next few months. So let's all remember that what he said here tonight. I'll be very proud. I'm going to call you and remind you about what we did here. So right. well, you'll have a very good But thank you. Anything else? I think we're good. I uh, really do appreciate you making the time, Owen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, we all learned a lot. And once again, we just want to really thank you for uh, taking the time here tonight. Great, Michael. Well, it's good to be with all of you. And um, in real estate, best of luck with your careers. Uh, thank you. Enjoy the time together. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.